No, this isn't a pregnancy test. It's a temperature sensor. Over the last seven years, I got two degrees hotter. I graduated high school, earned a bachelor's in neuroscience, and put on a white coat. Hell, I even swapped out my t-shirt and basketball shorts for, well, uh, never mind. Those have stayed. Many, many things happened between double clenched fists Michael over here to clean cut champagne popping Michael over there. Those things, both professionally and personally, are the key reasons I got into my dream medical school, UCLA, without taking a gap year. Today, I'm going to share five things I wish I knew back when I was at UCLA as a pre-med. Step number one, spend extra time acclimating. What do houses and pre-meds have in common? Well, for both, foundations are the most important thing. That means if you got nothing else right your freshman year, you're in a good place if you feel acclimated to college. Adjusting to college may very well be the hardest thing you've had to do up until this point in your life. In an instant, you'll become a small fish in a very, very big pond. This means you won't be the brightest, nor the most athletic, nor the most charismatic, nor the most handsome. I sure wasn't. There will always be a person who's better than you at something that you like to do. Learn to be okay with that, ignore the noise, and celebrate the unique combination that is you. If you brush your unique identity away as something unimportant, you'll quickly be overwhelmed with the number one problem most pre-meds face, imposter syndrome. You'll never feel like you belong. For everyone, acclimated or not, I highly recommend reading Mark Manson's book, the subtle arts of not giving an F. Here's a three sentence summary courtesy of James Clear. Finding something important and meaningful in your life is the most productive use of your time and energy. This is true because every life has problems associated with it and finding meaning in your life will help you sustain the effort needed to overcome the particular problems you face. Thus, we can say the key to living a good life is not giving an F about most things, but rather giving an F only about the things that align with your personal values. Step number two, absolutely prioritize your grades. GPA or grade point average is exactly what it sounds like. It's an average of how you performed in all of your coursework. It's formulaic, simple, and sterile doesn't really care about who you are. Psychologically, it's a royal decree and makes every pre-med feel defined by a three-digit number. I've met far too many students who have lost themselves in this game of GPAs. They've forgotten their love for soccer. They underestimate how much good they do around the house for their aging grandparents. They forget that they are in the top 1% of all North Americans playing League of Legends all because of their GPA. Their identities fade into the background. 3.67 pulses, 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 and is on their mind constantly. It's honestly just dehumanizing, just like how every player in the Squid Games was defined by their number. The terrible thing about the mathematics underlying your GPA is that if you get off to a cold start, it will be an uphill battle. So do not get off to a bad start. You do not want to be climbing uphill all of your college career. The great thing about studying is that it's a genuine science. And until I develop my own science-backed fundamental series, I wholeheartedly recommend Ali Abdal's master class on studying. I've watched it now two or three times and I single-handedly believe that that is the reason I've been able to earn the marks that I have. And even if you've already watched it, revisit it again because studying is what you and I do for a profession. Studying is how we pay the bills. So make sure that you are studying at the top of your game. This is an investment that will pay off a hundred times fold. Step number three, build healthy habits. The freshman 15 is no joke. And I completely understand why millions of college students experience it every single year. College is stressful. And when the going gets tough, it's easy to whip out the, hey, I'm young card. I'm in my young twenties. Anything I do doesn't matter. I'm invincible. You'll throw away all your physical and mental health needs and just say that it's okay because all of this is temporary. And this is actually part of why building habits is so difficult. Because if you miss one workout, you won't get fat overnight. Similarly, if you kill one workout, you won't look like the rock tomorrow either. Because of this, skipping workouts, eating unhealthy becomes real easy. If you skipped last Tuesday's workout and didn't really seem like it had an effect on your health, well, you could probably skip Thursday's workout without having any issues either. We're going back to James Clear and his book, Atomic Habits. Here, he explains why these individual decisions mean so much. He writes, 
But when we repeat 1% errors day after day by replicating poor decisions, duplicating tiny mistakes, and rationalizing little excuses, our small choices compound into toxic results. It's the accumulation of many missteps, a 1% decline here and there, that eventually leads to a problem. The impact created by a change in your habits is similar to the effect of shifting the route of an airplane by just a few degrees. Imagine you're flying from LA to New York City. If a pilot leaving from LAX adjusts the heading just 3.5 degrees south, you'll land in Washington, D.C. instead of New York. Such a small change is barely noticeable at takeoff. The nose of the plane moves maybe just a few feet. But when magnified across the entire United States, you end up hundreds of miles apart. Learn to eat healthy, exercise, and sleep. Those three habits alone will do more for you than any nootropic, special supplement, or magic blend of coffee can ever do. And if you think those are the fundamentals, well, they are, and they will put you far above your peers because I promise you, your friends aren't mastering these three things. And today we'll make some progress. I challenge you now to pause the video and think of the smallest thing you can do in each of these domains to make a difference. It might be one push up. It might be pausing the video and just taking one deep breath. It might be going to the salad bar and just putting one leaf of spinach onto your plate. And after you do that, you celebrate. That may be the one push up you've done in three months. The next day, I challenge you to do one more. You may be facing off against the brightest kids with the most expensive chemistry tutors and the brand new MacBook M1. But if they're coming off of an all-nighter, having just downed a vanilla milkshake as well as Deneb's carne asada fries, I think I like your odds. Step number four, explore extracurricular activities. Your pre-med years are paradoxically long and short. You have enough time to start and stop and start every extracurricular on campus, but you'll always wish you had a little bit more time for the extracurriculars that you truly love. The medical school application I sent in has 15 extracurricular activities, but it doesn't include the 10 that I started, put significant hours into, and eventually quit. You'll never hear of them. No one has, except for me. But just because they don't exist on paper doesn't mean they weren't meaningful. I had to learn through those activities about what I truly cared about. And those activities that I truly ended up caring about, those are the reasons that I ended up at my dream medical school, UCLA. So head out to your school's enormous activities fair. Sign up for literally every club that piques your interest, even 1%, and get involved. Put in 20 to 50 hours to really determine if it's right for you. After that, be honest with yourself. If you really love it, and the only reason you're not putting more time into it is because you feel like you should be spending that time on medical school related extracurriculars, well, I'm here to save you. You've been indoctrinated. You're not a pre-med robot. You'll be happier, and when you're happier, you'll invest more time, and when you invest more time, you'll make larger impacts. And those larger impacts are the things that are going to end up making you more competitive in the long run. In short, the happier you are, the more competitive you will be. And yes, to be extremely explicit, even if the activity is not hospital volunteering, yes. And if you decide you don't really care, even if it's an activity that people say is really good for medical school, like serving the folks experiencing homelessness down in downtown Los Angeles, that's okay, stop doing it. You have permission to stay true to yourself. I promise you, you will hurt your odds if you go on engaging with activities you think medical schools will want to see that you truthfully don't enjoy. Prioritize depth over breadth and always have an open mind. You might mess around and find yourself refereeing intramural basketball games at 10 p.m., playing League of Legends until 3 a.m., and ending up real damn happy with your college years. Step number five. Make a plan. One thing that stresses me the hell out is if I'm coasting without a plan. If I'm driving and my passenger is responsible for navigating, I'm talking to you. If my girlfriend is watching this, I'm talking to you. The same goes with your journey to medicine. Set a goal, figure out how you're gonna get to that goal, 
and make a plan moving backwards from there. You don't need to know exactly what you're gonna be doing at 2.15 p.m. on July 17th, one and a half years from now, but you do need to know when your major milestones are and how you're gonna get there. I find it very useful to start at the finish line at the white coat ceremony and draw a line backwards. The interview, the secondaries, the personal statements, the primaries, the MCAT, all the prerequisites. Start at the finish line and move backwards. And at the very least, here are some key questions that you need to answer when creating your own timeline to medical school. Number one, when do I want to put on a white coat and start medical school? Number two, if I want to start medical school on XYZ date, when do I have to apply to medical school? Number three, if I want to apply to medical school, what is everything I'll need to have ready? Number four, one of the things I'll need to have ready is the MCAT. When's the best time for me to take it? Number five, when am I going to take the prerequisite courses that will be good to have taken before the MCAT? Number six, what do I plan on doing with each summer? If you have questions about building out your own pre-med timeline, I have a two hour workshop dedicated to answering just that question. You'll find in my YouTube account, how to get into medical school. That's what it's titled. And I know you'll find some value there. Your pre-med years are a hell of a time but man, do they go by quickly. For every pre-med out there, I recommend you spend all of your time doing the following things. Acclimating to college, bulletproofing your studying, and subsequently your GPA, building healthy habits, exploring extracurricular activities, and making a plan. If you get those five things right, you're well on your way to getting into medical school. And if you have any extra time after doing all those things well, and you surely will, I recommend that you spend that on enjoying your life, enjoying your college years guilt-free. No! Yeah, <laughs>